powerful, it actually costs the Earth to wobble on its axis, slowing its revolution and shortening that fateful day by almost three microseconds. The 2004 tsunami is a mega disaster that came out of nowhere. Or did it? The Earth appears to be getting more deadly than ever before. We know that there are many cases where the worst has not yet been seen. Are natural disasters becoming more frequent and more deadly? To find out, we'll explore one of the century's most destructive events and examine three critical cities where earthquakes, volcanoes, and hurricanes are poised to strike death blows against helpless populations. Can we avoid the outbursts of our violent planet? Or are we like this man on a beach in Thailand, helpless in the path of Mother Nature's fury? This suburb of Banda Aceh in northern Sumatra, just before the tsunami. And after. One bridge survived the ocean's onslaught. Barely. Yesterday, 30,000 Sumatrans lived in sight of this bridge. But the ocean's upheaval killed nine out of 10 people here. Julianto and his son Rido miraculously beat the odds. We don't have anything anymore except what we have on our bodies. Two thousand four's disaster robbed Julianto and Rido of more than their possessions. Father and son scour refugee camps in search of Rito's two sisters and his mother. I feel that since I was saved, then maybe my mother is out there somewhere. We are looking for everyone. It's been a century since a major tsunami had hit northern Sumatra. But the islanders fear they haven't seen the worst. The monster that terrifies them came from a commonplace force of nature. About a dozen tectonic plates make up the Earth's crust. Floating on a sea of magma, these massive slabs constantly jostle each other. Just off the coast of Sumatra, a fault line where the India Plate and the Burma Plate meet. As one subducted the other, it released a tremendous amount of energy. This is a thrust fault, and it created the killer quake. And because it happened underwater, it displaced a massive volume of ocean, breeding the quake's deadly twin, a tsunami. The quake was among the most devastating in history measuring up to 9.3 on the Richter scale. It exploded with the force of more than 36,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. Its 
staggering size makes scientists worry about the future of our planet. Geologist John Ebel desperately scours seismic records to find out. Could more be coming? This is really one of the most profound earthquakes we've seen so far on planet Earth. From 1946 to 1964, we had several earthquakes of this size take place over a very short time span. Then we go 40 years after 1964, nothing this large on the Earth until 2004. Risking aftershocks and disease, scientists take stock just how large it was. Every time I turn the corner, it's just something else just blows my mind. Here's a boat on top of a pickup truck wedged in a building. Think of the force it must take to bend a truck bed. Tsunami scientist Jose Barrero uses surveying tools and GPS mapping to quantify the tsunami's power at maximum impact. An analysis of the wave's destruction could offer ways to protect people from the next one. And on a planet that seems ever more violent, the next one's almost guaranteed. Already, Barrero reaches a conclusion that should send chills through coastal city dwellers everywhere. Living in a city actually makes people more vulnerable to this disaster than elsewhere. If you're, say, in a coconut grove or something and there's a tsunami coming, the water's going to spread out, but here you don't have much, uh, much chance of, uh, of escaping. Escape? Almost impossible. The surging water tore through town, gathering cars, trucks, and building debris into a raging wall of destruction. As people scrambled for safety, the town's buildings channeled the unstoppable juggernaut into narrow streets, where it bulldozed everything in its path. Its speed increased, and the reach of death climbed ever higher. The difference between life and death was literally measured in inches. If you were here, you would have lived. If you were here, you died. Death may be planning another visit to Sumatra. One geologist estimates that only a fraction of this fault, just 6% of its total length, caused the killer quake. That leaves 94%, some 2,400 miles of the fault line, apparently dormant. There's more. This quake may spawn a future killer quake somewhere else in the world. A new theory suggests earthquakes are caused by a global chain reaction. And Sumatra's hammer blow may itself have been triggered by an earthquake a year earlier and half a world away. December 26, 2003, exactly one year before Banda Aceh's killer wave, a massive earthquake flattens the city of Bam Iran, taking some 26,000 lives. Though Bam is about 3,000 miles from Sumatra, the two disasters may be part of a deadly chain reaction. Planet's fault lines may act like a spider's web. Moving one threat could affect others with deadly results. 
If these plates are all part of one vast interconnected system, then a movement in a plate on one side of the world will cause jostling on the other side of the world. So why shouldn't the collision of two plates in Iran produce a series of shock waves and judders which eventually, a year later, caused the Indian plate to subduct below the Burma plate, which is what happened off Banda Aceh. If the theory is true, the Banda Aceh quake could set off another somewhere else in the world. Many major cities are near fault lines. San Francisco, Mexico City, Taipei, Tokyo, Los Angeles. But if one city is poised to suffer one of history's worst natural disasters, it is Istanbul, Turkey. The North Anatolian fault line. This junction of two tectonic plates has been coughing up major quakes with stunning frequency in the last half century. Like cascading dominoes, the quakes are bearing down on Istanbul. The death toll caused by a quake here would be staggering. This home to 10 million is the front line for examining our violent earth. Hundreds of thousands could die. Why so many? Each year, 250,000 new people crowd into Istanbul and its surrounding suburbs. For years, apartment buildings sprang up to house the influx. Most were made of shoddy materials and thrown together at a reckless pace. They're unable to fend off the slightest tremor. Like the village that was hit when the last domino fell, just 65 miles from Istanbul. August 1999. A quake measuring 7.4 on the Richter scale strikes the neighborhood Arzu Demir calls home. It's 3.02 in the morning when her world explodes. At first I could not understand what happened. I heard my mom and dad's voices. I said, don't come into the room. Get out. Save yourself. They didn't listen. The quake thunders for 45 seconds. Demir's poorly constructed apartment building doesn't stand a chance. Within seconds, the top three floors collapse. She and her siblings should be dead. But somehow, they fall into a pocket in the rubble, just big enough to hold them. Demir is severely injured. Her time is running out. For hours, rescue workers grapple with debris and slabs of concrete, looking for any signs of survivors. I was in immense pain. Endless pain. I started to hear voices. Her parents are among the more than 17,000 killed. But Demir and her siblings survive. Had this quake struck Istanbul, an estimated 35,000 buildings would have been destroyed. For Demir, an unspeakable ordeal. But the truth is, violent eruptions actually stabilize our planet. Earthquakes act as release valves for pressure building deep in the planet's core. Without them, the pressure would build until the Earth's crust could no longer contain it. Resulting in an apocalypse. 
collapse. Obliterating life on Earth. How can we learn to live with these terrifying events? One idea is to diffuse the power of big quakes by creating small, man-made ones. A machine already exists to do just that. It was born at the height of the Cold War. A Soviet-made earthquake machine. Designed as a new energy source, yielded as much power as a small nuclear reactor. Seismologists harness that power to measure the Earth's crust. A rocket engine shot a burst of energy through an electromagnetic field, 30 miles straight down. In effect, Soviet scientists were shooting lightning bolts into the Earth. Yet they were surprised by what happened next. The Earth shot back with earthquakes. By creating small quakes, the machine could relieve pressure building under the Earth's crust. This might avert the kind of megaquake bearing down on Istanbul. But if the quake maker were positioned over a fall, no one knows what it would do. The fear? A catastrophic seismic event. An unstoppable chain reaction of earthquakes and tsunamis around the globe. Experimentation with Mother Nature is a very, very difficult thing that we have to be careful of. We might actually trigger a bigger earthquake than the one we were trying to prevent. The U.S. military bought the quake machine after the Cold War ended. Where is it today? Unknown. But the quake machine isn't our only hope. For decades, hydrologists have observed that when wells are dug deep into the earth, they can generate small tremors. This happens because water can push minor faults apart, causing the plates to slide. The theory is the same as with the quake machine. More small quakes instead of a big one. But like the quake machine, the issue is control. Inducing quakes is an inexact science. Once you begin using water to create tremors, you might instead release a killer quake. Like the one threatening Istanbul. <laughs> Seismic engineer Mustafa Erdek isn't counting on dubious interventions to save his city. He's seeking real solutions today. Because it's not a question of if, but when. The chances of having a large earthquake in the city in the next 30 years is about 65%. So my feelings tell me that it's, it's pretty much due. His secret weapon in quake prediction is a former church turned mosque called the Hagia Sophia. It's a sacred site by day. A high-tech early warning system around the clock. Erdik has crammed the mosque with monitors that transmit data to sensors at his hilltop laboratory. The mosque and more than 50 other locations across the city act as ears on the ground, alerting him to any signs of tremors. At the first hint of a quake, the system automatically shuts down major industrial plants to avoid leaks of dangerous materials. At the same time, it sends emergency response teams a map that identifies hardest hit areas. At 
most, the system will diminish the damage, not eliminate it. But these efforts could save thousands of lives. However, there's a bigger problem. Affecting not just Istanbul, but every city on a major fault line. The Earth is prone to periods of increased seismic activity, and we might be entering one such phase. The most recent quakes could be just the beginning. Meanwhile, we're compounding the danger. Like Istanbul citizens, people all over the world aren't moving out of danger zones. They're moving into them. And earthquakes aren't the most explosive disasters our violent Earth can throw at us. Natural disasters dominate our headlines. Military now rushing to deliver food, As body counts water. soar, we feel like unwelcome guests on an increasingly hostile planet. And nowhere is the peril more apparent than in the shadow of a volcano. The Earth is home to some 600 active volcanoes. Half a billion live within their blast range. Some are known killers. Montserrat in the Caribbean. The 1997 eruption buried the nation's capital in ash. Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. Its 1991 blast was ten times the size of Mount St. Helens. Active volcanoes can appear dormant, but many are in fact ticking time bombs. Naples, Italy, an uneasy neighbor of a seismic serial killer, making it one city most likely to suffer a fiery death. Here, 600,000 people live within the Red Zone. That's the blast range of what's undoubtedly the world's most treacherous volcano. Vesuvius. A killer with a rap sheet a mile long. Its historic eruption in 79 AD entombed two entire cities, Pompeii and Herculaneum each about as close to Vesuvius as downtown Naples. Their victims are haunting reminders of an ancient disaster and a warning to Neapolitans today. While most of the world knows the story of Pompeii, few realize just how often Vesuvius erupts. Last time was little more than a half a century ago, in 1944. The Allied forces had invaded Italy and were driving north. A few tremors from a quiet volcano was the last thing on Neapolitans' minds. For more than a week, Pumice, volcanic gases, and searing hot ash shot out. Rivers of lava poured down the mountainside. We had the, the sensation that our life could come to an end in the most horrible way. The 1944 eruption killed 26 Neapolitans. The city got off easy which is perhaps why its lesson was seemingly ignored. Because from 1944 to 2004, those living in Vesuvius' shadow grew to 600,000. And all the while, the mass murderer 
has been building toward disaster. Marco Di Lello pleads with families to move out of the red zone, the area most likely to be devastated by the next eruption. The Murano family is considering De Lello's plea. In exchange for a payment of around $35,000, they would abandon their home many years. If they do, that's one down and thousands to go. But why haven't the Muranos and others like them left the red zone already? Vesuvius, like other volcanoes that go long periods between eruptions, holds a deadly attraction. Mineral-rich volcanic soil creates an inviting paradise on the outside. Beneath, murder brews in its molten heart. Like earthquakes, most active volcanoes are born from the rubbing of tectonic plates which brings up magma from deep in the earth. Some volcanoes in the middle of plates aren't as volatile. They continuously spew lava, relieving the underground pressure. Volcanoes on faults, like Vesuvius, build magma and pressure for years, till they erupt with explosive force. A force of nature that's impossible to stop. It would happen like this. First, excessive gas leaks, bulges and swelling. Then, when things get shaky, it's time to run. Because after those tremors, ghostly silence followed by that nation. By studying these signs, scientists can predict when volcanoes will erupt. And few volcanoes are as closely monitored as Vesuvius. I think it's the most dangerous volcano in the world. Because it, there is no way to, to, to save the people uh, without the complete evacuation of the area. Volcanologist Giuseppe Master Lorenzo keeps a close watch on Vesuvius gases and temperature. Today, the monster sleeps quietly. When Master Lorenzo detects telltale signs, he can give Naples a full month's warning. What he can't do is force Neapolitans to flee. One family already has. Back at the Murano household, they've decided to get out while the getting's good. At least with volcanoes, you can leave Ground Zero. But what about when the disaster comes to you? Another of our planet's furies literally arises from thin air and delivers savage destruction with lightning speed. But even if hurricanes are the most elusive natural disasters, they may offer the best chance we have of actual intervention. Small changes can really have a big effect on the weather. Can we stop one of these killers in its tracks? Nineteen ninety-two's Hurricane Andrew. 
with gusts up to 165 miles per hour. This Category 5 terror was the most destructive United States hurricane on record. One like it might be headed your way. Because if you live anywhere along the hurricane belt that straddles our planet, your ocean view might change into a monster like this. Hurricanes are incredibly powerful. A single major hurricane is expending more power, more energy, than all the electric utilities on Earth combined. Together. 2004 was the most active hurricane season in more than 50 years. It's part of a spike in hurricane activity that began in the 1990s and could last for decades. And few cities in the world stand to suffer more from just one major blow than New Orleans. Locals call it the bowl. When a big storm does strike the Big Easy, it will likely fill the ball, taking some 50,000 lives. What we're talking about in this case is tens of thousands of casualties, of deaths, and affecting an area that would be uh, uh, 30 or 40 square miles. Every hurricane season, the nightmare reappears. September 2004. Hurricane Ivan churns through the Gulf of Mexico, gathering strength. Near landfall, it's a Category 5 storm, with winds topping out at 160 miles per hour. As Ivan's track swerves unpredictably, the visions begin. Visions of a storm surge blowing through Bourbon Street. Of houses and buildings bursting apart in the wind. And, most frightening of all, visions of a city drowning. As Ivan approaches, 600,000 people heed the warnings and evacuate New Orleans. But Hurricane Ivan ends up veering east and striking the Florida Panhandle. It kills dozens and causes billions in damages. It's a terrible tragedy for Florida. But New Orleans has survived its annual game of Russian roulette. The city knows its time will come, but scientists are desperate to find out when. The records only go back 150 years, and not a single major storm has hit New Orleans. So accurately predicting how often they strike has been impossible. Until today. Louisiana State University scientist Campbell Lill believes the answer lies buried in the mud. Lill is the founding father of a field called paleotempestology, the study of historic weather patterns. When a major hurricane strikes, the storm surge creates a layer of sediments. Analyzing samples of mud should show how often New Orleans has been hit. Today, Lil is pulling core samples from some nine feet down near New Orleans. That nine feet gives Lil a picture 5,000 years into the past. We must know the past before we can uh, predict or forecast the future. Um, you may say a $30 billion question is how often does a city like New Orleans get hit by a, um, a, a Category 5 hurricane? Back in the lab, Lil splits the core in half. 
The telltale sediment of a major hurricane turns up about every 30 inches. Oh, beautiful. For 300 the, uh, years. The bands here? Until we got to this part, and the most distinct layers are this and that. And this is a thicker one. You see how sharp the contact is. And this is definitely uh, an event. The spacing of events tells Dr. Lil New Orleans is living on borrowed time. A major hurricane is way overdue. New Orleans so far has been very lucky because um, it kind of dodged the bullet during the last hundred years. So even though that New Orleans has been lucky, we must be prepared. The city's not entirely defenseless. Over the last century, the Army Corps of Engineers has built a system of levees 15 to 20 feet high. That might stop a flood caused by a Category 2 or 3 hurricane. But a big one would send waters over the barrier. Coastal engineer Joe Suheda knows New Orleans' nightmare is measured in feet. This is to protect from a Category 3 or Category 2 storm. But in the worst case scenario, the actual water level would be up around the top of my head. So it would be about six feet or so above the top of this levee. Residents here call the nightmare scenario filling the bowl. A storm surge bursts over the levees and has nowhere to go. The city becomes a lake. Its floodwaters are rendered toxic by sewage and chemical waste, and infested with disease. Cleanup, all but impossible. Joe Suheda wants to go to extremes to prevent that apocalypse. He proposes building a massive new wall to shield the bowl. be another way by tackling the storm before it gets here one of the most destructive disasters hurricanes alone may be tamed <laughs> we have ways to change the atmosphere in a way that other earth scientists just just wouldn't be able to do atmospheric scientist Ross Hoffman has done the impossible he's changed a hurricane's path and even slowed them down. At least on a computer. He's shown that even minor changes in the conditions surrounding a hurricane can dramatically change the storm's behavior. In an attempt to reduce the winds by seeding the clouds near the center of the storm with silver iodide crystals. But he's not the first in a frantic quest to tame the monsters. Each year from June through October, In the 1960s, the U.S. embarked on an ambitious experiment called Project Storm Fury. The team tried dropping chemicals into the wind currents just outside the hurricane's fast-moving eyewall, hoping to slow down its strongest winds. But results? Disappointing. The bold initiative never succeeded in weakening hurricanes. Project Storm Fury was canned. Today, other scientists want to try a different approach. One that attacks a hurricane's moisture supply. We know that hurricanes get their main source of energy is at the ocean surface. Hurricanes live on two things. Water and heat. Dry up the water in a hurricane's clouds, and theoretically, it evaporates. A team out of Florida is experimenting with a gel that absorbs more than 3,000 times its mass and moisture. 
trouble is, to deploy enough gel, you'd have to fly almost 400 super tanker aircraft into the hurricane about every 90 minutes. A costly solution, years from reality. Yet even if we had a proven strategy to eliminate hurricanes, we might have second thoughts about using it. Hurricanes provide enormous environmental benefits by redistributing heat in the atmosphere. If we like the Earth the way it is now, then we have to accept some of its, uh, some of the side effects, and, and hurricanes are one of those things. Accepting the mortal danger of hurricanes and other natural disasters may be a bitter pill to swallow. But as we've seen, human plans to avert mega-disasters are futuristic even foolhardy. How vulnerable are we on a planet that seems to be getting more violent, more deadly, more hostile every year? Sometimes it's hard to escape the fear that we're living on an ever more violent planet. Just three months after 2004's mega-disaster, Banda Aceh's worst nightmare comes true. Another major quake explodes off the coast. Shock waves are felt around the world. Hardened by 2004's catastrophe, victims in Banda Aceh await a new killer tsunami never comes. Why? One theory. This quake occurred in shallower waters. Less water displaced means a tragedy averted. But does this new quake confirm fears of an endless chain reaction of quakes? Banda Aceh still reels from December's punishing wave. And with the latest quake, new proof of a planet seemingly out of control. Happy to this my children too. I cannot. Allah, my God, Allah, Tuhan. This woman last saw her family shopping on this street. One of these buildings holds their bodies. She cannot rest until they do. And we the fear that we could share a similar fate. Some scientists predict another mega tsunami could come from an entirely different source. Not a quake, but a volcano. This huge volcano is part of the Canary Islands in the eastern Atlantic. It's known as Cumbre Vieja, and geologists fear that if it erupts, some of its flank could crash into the sea, generating a tsunami so big it could strike northern Africa, western Europe, and even the eastern seaboard of the United States. Scenarios like this make us feel the Earth is getting more violent. Here are the facts. Volcanoes. Up to 60 erupt every year. And with more people moving into red zones, the death toll is sure to rise. 
Earthquakes. The planet does suffer periods of more intense activity. Are we in one now? Too soon to know. But the signs are disturbing. Hurricanes. They've been on the rise since the mid-1990s. And they could be getting more powerful. Some believe global warming provides more fuel for hurricanes. That's bad news for cities like New Orleans. But the increase in storms may just be part of a normal atmospheric cycle. This is the Earth simply showing that it's a living entity and it's flexing its muscles, it's, it's breathing, it's creating and recreating. It has to destroy some of itself in order to recreate more of itself. There are six times more fatal disasters reported today than in the 1960s. But the violent Earth is not to blame. The real cause, around half the world's people live in danger zones, prone to inevitable Earth catastrophes. Most of these places are in poorer countries. Soaring populations, poor building quality, and the absence of warning systems mean rising death tolls are a certainty. For rich and poor, our best options are improving prediction and getting out of harm's way. Near volcanoes, in earthquake zones, on coastlines vulnerable to hurricanes and tsunamis. We live on the edge, and we occasionally pay the price for doing so. Because what makes places beautiful are the forces that from time to time destroy them. Destruction will always be a part of Earth's rejuvenating processes. But for many of us, it's our choice whether we'll stand in the path of disaster. Into a raging wall of destruction. As people scrambled for safety, the town's buildings channeled the unstoppable juggernaut into narrow streets where it bulldozed everything in its path. Its speed increased, and the reach of death climbed ever higher. The difference between life and death was literally measured in inches. If you were here, you would have lived. If you were here, you would have died. Death may be planning another visit to Sumatra. One geologist estimates that only a fraction of this fault, just 6% of its total length, caused the killer quake. That leaves 94%, some 2,400 miles of the fault line, apparently dormant. There's more. This quake may spawn a future killer quake somewhere else in the world. A new theory suggests earthquakes are caused by a global chain reaction. And Sumatra's hammer blow may itself have been triggered by an earthquake a year earlier and half a world away.
so powerful, it actually costs the Earth to wobble on its axis, slowing its revolution, and shortening that fateful day by almost three microseconds. The 2004 tsunami is a mega disaster that came out of nowhere. Or did it? The Earth appears to be getting more deadly than ever before. We know that there are many cases where the worst has not yet been seen. Are natural disasters becoming more frequent and more deadly? To find out, we'll explore one of the century's most destructive events and examine three critical cities where earthquakes, volcanoes, and hurricanes are poised to strike death blows against helpless populations. Can we avoid the outbursts of our violent planet? Or are we like this man on a beach in Thailand, helpless in the path of Mother Nature's fury? This suburb of Banda Aceh in northern Sumatra, just before the tsunami. And after. One bridge survived the ocean's onslaught. Barely. Yesterday, 30,000 Sumatrans lived in sight of this bridge. But the ocean's upheaval killed nine out of 10 people here. Yulianto and his son Rido miraculously beat the odds. We don't have anything anymore, except what we have on our bodies. Two thousand four's disaster robbed Yulianto and Rido of more than their possessions. Father and son scour refugee camps in search of Rito's two sisters and his mother. I feel that since I was saved, then maybe my mother is out there somewhere. We are looking for everyone. It's been a century since a major tsunami had hit northern Sumatra. But the islanders fear they haven't seen the worst. The monster that terrifies them came from a commonplace force of nature. About a dozen tectonic plates make up the Earth's crust. Floating on a sea of magma, these massive slabs constantly jostle each other. Just off the coast of Sumatra, a fault line where the India Plate and the Burma Plate meet. As one subducted the other, it released a tremendous amount of energy. This is a thrust fault, and it created the killer quake. And because it happened underwater, it displaced a massive volume of ocean, breeding the quake's deadly twin, a tsunami. The quake was among the most devastating in history, measuring up to 9.3 on the Richter scale. It exploded with the force of more than 36,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. It 
staggering size makes scientists worry about the future of our planet. Geologist John Ebel desperately scours seismic records to find out. Could more be coming? This is really one of the most profound earthquakes we've seen so far on planet Earth. From 1946 to 1964, we had several earthquakes of this size take place over a very short time span. Then we go 40 years after 1964, nothing this large on the Earth until 2004. Risking aftershocks and disease, scientists take stock just how large it was. Every time I turn the corner, it's just something else just blows my mind. Here's a boat on top of a pickup truck wedged in a building. Think of the force it must take to bend a truck bed. Tsunami scientist Jose Barrero uses surveying tools and GPS mapping to quantify the tsunami's power at maximum impact. An analysis of the wave's destruction could offer ways to protect people from the next one. And on a planet that seems ever more violent, the next one's almost guaranteed. Already, Barrero reaches a conclusion that should send chills through coastal city dwellers everywhere. Living in a city actually makes people more vulnerable to this disaster than elsewhere. If you're, say, in a coconut grove or something and there's a tsunami coming, the water's going to spread out, but here you don't have much, uh, much chance of, uh, of escaping. Escape? Almost impossible. The surging water tore through town, gathering cars, trucks, and buildings.